Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, let's move into the book of 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. In your Bibles tonight, we're talking about Elisha. And tonight, we're going to be reading a few verses of Scripture from 2 Kings chapter 2. When you find your passage, if you would, join us as we uh, read from beginning in verse number 19. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse number 19. While you're turning, one other announcement. I don't like to say anything along these lines. It ha happens to pretend to me, and I don't like to say anything bad, but I do want your prayers. I appreciate your prayers. I've got surgery coming up uh, in a few weeks, and uh, it's pretty intense, and I appreciate your prayers. Coming up the second week of uh, May, and uh, ask your prayers. All right, 2 Kings chapter number 2, verse number 19. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death, death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Father, thank you again tonight that we can gather together around your word in your house. And now help us tonight. Meet with us in a special way. Pull some truths, Lord, from these passages of Scripture, which will help us down the journey and strengthen us for the journey, the, the days ahead of us this week, and Lord, it's not too early to begin praying for the Lord's Day. I pray for this Sunday that you'll meet with us in a great way, in a mighty way. And bless all of our ministries, our bus ministries, and bless all of the media ministries even tonight. And Lord, may someone out there this evening come across the media ministry who has a need. And may the need be met this evening through the Word of God and the things that we would have to say. And we'll praise you for what you do, because we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. Well, we remember well, we've been talking about for several weeks up until our previous Bible study, we've been talking about Elijah. And Elijah came down to the end of his life. Elisha followed him across the Jordan. And the chariots and the horses of fire came down from heaven. And uh, I like to use the word rapture because there are several insta instances in the scripture when we can use the word rapture. It literally means to catch up or to snatch away. And Enoch was raptured and he was snatched away. And now we learn in our previous Bible study that Elijah was raptured and snatched away and he dropped his mantle because he asked Elisha what he could do for him before he left him. And Elisha said, I'd like to have a double portion of what you have before you go back to heaven. He said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, uh, if there's a possibility, I can do it. He said, you've asked a hard thing, then, uh, then so be it. And, and of course, he dropped his mantle. Elisha picked the mantle up. He stroked the waters of the Jordan. They parted, and he walked back across on dry ground. Now tonight, we find Elisha at the city of Jericho. And we find in our study this evening that 
there's, there's, some, there's a problem. There's a major problem. And I want to begin tonight in verse number 19 with what Elisha saw. I want you to watch this in your Bible. There's, there are so many truths in these few verses of Scripture. I won't have time to cover them all, but I want to try to, as I do in my Sunday school class, do a flyover and uh, let you see some of these truths that many times we read over them and uh, we don't glean what's here. But I want you to notice that the men of the city came to Elisha and they're bragging about the city of Jericho. And I want you to notice, if you will, in verse 19, what they said. I pray thee the situation of this city is pleasant. Now that's a very interesting statement because if you know anything about your Bibles, and I'm going to show you this in a minute in uh, the book of Joshua. When the city of Jericho was destroyed and they marched around it seven times, shouted and they blowed the horns and the walls came tumbling down, there was some things said about this city that's very interesting. Many years now has transpired since that incident and the city of Jericho is still a city of reality. But it's not a city as it originally was. But with all of the problems in the city of Jericho, they made a statement about the city here. Notice what he said. They came to him and they said, the city is pleasant. Now, if you go back and look at the history of this city, even though it had been destroyed to some degree, there, it was still a beautiful place. Uh, historians tell us that in the background of the city, there was beautiful, they called them the mountains of Moab. Beautiful mountains in the background. And it was known as the city of palms. And I, I noticed in the book of Deuteronomy, we find that phrase. Let me, let me read you this verse. Deuteronomy 34, 3, and the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho. Listen to what they say. The valley of Jericho the city of palm trees unto Zoar. So Jericho was known as the city of palm trees. Very beautiful city. As a matter of fact, if they'd had cameras back in the days that we're reading about right now, they would have probably took cameras and took pictures of historic sites, present sites in the city of Jericho, and they would have probably took those pictures and put them, put them together in a brochure to advertise the beauties of the city and to invite people to come by there and to visit that it could be a very commercial city and spend some time in and around the city of Palms, the city of Jericho. So they come to Elisha and they say, now you know this is a pleasant city. But not only was that the estimate of the men of the city. That was the estimate of Elisha himself. Look again in verse number 19. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, watch this, as my Lord seeth. So they said, Elisha, you know this is a beautiful city. Because you've looked at it, you've been around it, you've been through it, and it's a beautiful city to look upon. And Elisha would have said, amen, yeah, we, we know that, we believe that, we agree with that. But uh, there, was, there was another problem that had developed in the city. Not only had it been an, a city that had been accursed in the days of Joshua, but they had a present problem. And I want you to notice with me in verse number 19 that the men of the city said unto Elijah, Behold, I pray thee, situation is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is naught, and the ground is barren. Now, would you try to get enter into this with me for just a moment with a mental picture? You would look at this city and you say, wow, with all of the destruction of yesteryear, it continues to be inhabited. 
And you can see the mountains in the background and you can see the palm trees all around it and all the gorgeous sights of this city. And it all looked good as they would stand around and talk and travel around through the city and travel around the countryside around the city. They say, wow, what a beautiful sight. What beautiful sights are to behold in this city. But there was something in the city that had literally placed a curse upon it. With all of its beauty, there was something that was greatly offsetting that. They could not appreciate the beauty of the city as they would like to because there was a problem in the city. And the problem was bringing havoc upon the entire city. I remember years ago, I, uh, <clears throat> with a dear friend of mine and some other preacher friends, we uh, went down to the mission field and uh, went down in uh, Port-au-Prince in Cape Haitian, Haiti. And uh, I remember when we got in the city, it was beyond my ability to comprehend the poverty. I, couldn't, I could not believe that people could live and exist in the poverty I experienced in Port-au-Prince and Cape Haitian. Uh, children out in the street at midnight hour and one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, uh, you could count their ribs. You, uh, you just could not believe how emaciated their countenances were. They, uh, they were downcast because they had nowhere to go. They lived in the city, they lived on the streets, and they lived off the streets. And you'd go down the street, and over here would be three or four families, and they had a huge, what we would call, where I came from, a huge wash pot. And they'd have it hanging there on some uh, little steel arms, and <clears throat> they would go out in the countryside, and they'd get a little wood and bring him there and, and uh, build a fire. I'm talking about on Main Street, all up and down the street, and you could see they'd got something and they put in there and they're trying to uh, provide enough food to keep body and soul together. And they had a marketplace there. And the stench of the marketplace was almost unbearable. They bring in things and what little money people had, their, the yearly income when I was there, and I understand it's not much better now. That was in the 70s. The yearly income was uh, $40 some dollars per person per year. $40 a year. That's what all they had to live on. And uh, it was horrendous how pitiful it was up and down the streets of Haiti. But our, the man who had taken us to Haiti had us uh, a motel up on the side of the mountain. And when it came time, we, was, we went through the town and uh, he had uh, purchased some tracks in their language, it was a Creole language. Uh, it was a language of a little mixture of what they had been accustomed to mixed with a little of English. It was a, it was a different kind of language that they had developed in order to uh, communicate. And uh, we was handing out tracks. And then when it started getting past dark, we got on in our vehicle, we drove up uh, on the side of the mountain and all of a sudden, coming in view here on the side of the mountain is this beautiful motel. And uh, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't phantom the contrast. Up here, halfway up the mountain, you pull up, they, ha they have this huge pool, and you look around the pool, and uh, there's banana trees. It's a tropical climate. You can see bananas hanging on the banana trees and there's orange trees and you see oranges hanging on the orange trees and uh, you see people in plush vehicles there and you see people walking around in very expensive uh, suits and dresses, etc. Uh, up there on the side of the mountain. And I couldn't believe it. And you go in the motel and the carpet's thick and uh, the bedroom's very expensive and you would think you were somewhere in New York City when you go in the motel. It was just, uh, it was beyond imagination <clears throat> that up just a few blocks halfway up the mountain, they have this expensive motel 
And then down at the foot of the mountain, they have this extreme poverty. When you get up there, you can't phantom what's down there. And when you get down there, it's hard to phantom what's up there. And here in our text tonight is a city that's beautiful, but it's a city that has become non-functional because they have a problem with a spring that is producing the water for the city and the surrounding territory. Now I was thinking about that and I, and I got to thinking about all of the beautiful cities of the world today. And there's a lot of them. As a matter of fact, I decided this afternoon to uh, just find out uh, what's the number one city in the world as far as beauty is concerned. I'm going somewhere with this. Don't go to sleep. But I got to thinking this evening, if I wanted to catch a plane and go somewhere, some part of the world, and I wanted to find uh, what is con considered one of the most beautiful cities at the top of the list. And I found this website out there where they, had, they did a survey. And in that survey, they had 10 cities. They said, these are the most beautiful cities of the world. And I said, this is interesting. Uh, and I started looking. At the top of the list, the people who had vacationed and the people who had visited all the way, way around the world, they said the most beautiful city in the world is Rome. And I got to thinking, well, if it's beauty, if it's that beautiful, what do they have as far as a crime rate? And I looked up the city of Rome, and the crime rate is 41% per thousand people. Terrible. Now, it's a beautiful city. But on the other side of the beauty... They've got a problem that every city in the world has. There's beautiful cities all over America. Quite interesting that the survey, there was not a single city in the top 20 that made the top 20 in America. I, I found that to be interesting. But they said the most beautiful city in the world is Rome. But it has nearly a 50% crime rate. Now, the externality of the city and the, and the construction of the city and the buildings of the city. And then if you go over there uh, and you, you look at all of the beauties of the church and you see all of those uh, paintings. And it, 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 I'm sure it's beautiful. I'm sure it's something to see. But behind that, in the background, they have a problem. And the beauty of the city will not offset the fact that there's sin in that city and there's a crime rate of about 50% that surrounds the beauty of the city. The second city, they said, that's the most beautiful city in the world is Florence, Italy. And I found it very interesting that 94% of the cities in that part of the country, 94% are safer than Florence, Italy with it being second in popularity, second in beauty. There's 94% of the other cities in that part of the country that are safer to visit. What, what, what's bringing all this about? You call it the serpent and it hisses when you say it, sin. Behind the beauty, there's a problem. Behind the beauty of Rome, there's a problem. Of course, big problem in Rome is false religion. But behind that, there's a problem. In Florence, Italy, there's a problem. In Paris, France, it was number three, they have a 60% crime rate per thousand people. Now people say, hey, these cities are beautiful. Yeah, they are. But they've all got one thing in, pro in common. They've got a problem behind the scenes. Behind the scene, the beauty does not offset the fact that men's hearts are wicked and sinful. And I don't care where you go in the world. I don't care what city you go to in the world. And the others were Edinburgh, Scotland, and London, uh, England, and, and Prague, Czech Republic, and other places in Italy. It matters not where you go. 
It matters not how beautiful all of them are. Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Greensboro, North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina, Los Angeles, California, New York City, uh, wherever you want to go, there are beautiful sights to behold, but all of them have one thing in common. There is the corrosion in the background of the depravity of the hearts of humankind. My friend, the whole problem in this world today is the problem of fallen nature and fallen humanity. And they come to Elisha and they said, wow, you know that this is a beautiful city. But by the way, we got a problem here. And they name the problem in the city. Notice if you, uh, uh, again, in verse number 19, what they said, uh, they said, uh, the water is naught. Now, that's a very interesting phrase. You see the word naught? Now, I want you to stay in your Bibles. Going, oh, I'm going to show you something in these words that's very interesting. They said the beauty of the city is wonderful, but the water is naught. The word naught there is a Hebrew word. It's ra, R-A. Is what it says. That's the very word that's used here. And it's translated evil. And it's translated wicked. And it's translated harmful or injurious. They said, hey, we've got a beautiful city, but, but our water supply is injurious. It's so injurious that it's almost sinful. And they said that the, bed, the bad water uh, has brought about, look at verse number 19 again. They said that the ground is barren. Now that's a very interesting word. The ground is barren. The water from the spring that was watering the land was producing water that was causing the land to be barren. Now the word barren there is the word we get the word miscarriage from. And here's what was happening. This water coming from the spring was supposed to be reaching out. This was the headwater. And it was supposed to be reaching out and bringing moisture and bringing water to the land. And it was doing that. But it was a water that had nutrients and it had, to some degree, literal poison in it. And as the water went out and as it irrigated the roots of the crops and the roots of the trees and the grass and their gardens. Here's what happened. As is testified in the word barren. Yes, they, they are alive. Yes, they've got green leaves. Yes, there's green grass. And when it's time for uh, the corn to produce corn, when it's time for the garden to produce vegetables or the fields to produce uh, for the cattle, what happens is it blooms. And then after the bloom, there comes the fruit. And what was happening was this. This is interesting. A little apple would come on the apple tree. And we've all been around apple trees when you see the little bloom and then you see the little apple that comes out of the bloom. And of course, you know this. I don't have to tell you. You, uh, you professors know this. Sometimes uh, you, you pick up an apple and you see a wormhole in it. And you ask yourself the question, I wonder if that worm has, has wormed his way in there. That's, not the, that's really not what happens. In the bloom of the apple tree, the worm gets down in the bloom and then the apple forms around the bloom and the worm says, eventually it's time to get out of here. Yeah. And, the, and the wormhole you see in the apple is most of the time, it's not the worm going in, it's the worm coming out. So have no fear. <laughs> that was a rabbit trail, but I wanted to drop that in your heart tonight. So when you go buy an apple, and sure as the world you buy one, cut it open, you'll see a worm right in the middle of it, but... <laughs> But what was happening, we all see these little apples that come up on the apple tree, our little pears on the pear tree. And we watch them as they get larger and larger and larger and they turn and they get ripe. And we go to the grocery store and we purchase them because they have come to the fullest of fruition. What was happening here in the word barren in this beautiful city 
beautiful city, the fruit is coming out of the bloom and it's getting very small and it's miscarrying. What's happening is it's not coming to fruition. A couple of years ago, I decided to get smart, put a couple of uh, three or four tomato plants behind my house. I love uh, good fresh tomatoes. Good loaf of bread, fresh bread, about a gallon of mayonnaise, <laughs> big red slice of tomato. Man, I'm telling you, that's good preaching right there. You, you put that piece of tomato on there and sometimes, and now some of you are not going to, you're not going to, you're going to, you're going to lose me right here. But sometimes I do that. I take a cucumber and cut it up, put it right on top of that. Sometimes I put some green pepper on it. Oh, I'm telling oh, I'm telling you, uh, your tongue wants to knock your brains out getting to it. It's, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. So I decided I was going to put me some tomato plants between the walk Back of my house, and my house, I have an area there, and I have it mulched and so forth. And I said to myself, Seth, I need a tomato plant. So I put three or four there, and uh, they started growing, and I decided, well, these things are doing pretty good. I need to go get me one of those wire basket things, and so it can grow up, and tomatoes will be on the side of it. And I can come out here and reach right into that wire basket thing, and I can get me a good tomato and go in there and sit down, and uh, I can feast on a good tomato sandwich. So I watched it and I'd water, water it every now and then and it got green and it looked prosperous and I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm going to have some good tomatoes. But I kept looking. Finally, I noticed there's a bloom or two out there and, and uh, I, you know, I got a little uh, hopeful that I'm going to have some tomatoes. And uh, finally, I got a little old green tomato about the size of your thumb. And I kept waiting, and I kept waiting, and I kept waiting, and I kept waiting. I hadn't had any tomatoes yet. I got, I got some nubs. A little, I don't know what the problem was. I guess my thumb's not I don't know what the problem was. But I looked and I hoped I never did get a thing there. I've got the little green tomatoes, but they never matured. Now, that's the word that's used right here. Uh, when the Bible uses this, this word that it was barren, it doesn't mean there was nothing there. It just means something came, but it never did mature. And there was something about this water supply that had brought a curse on the land. And the crops were in peril because of the water situation. The fruit trees could not bring forth the fruit. The gardens could not produce. And the bad water... Was, had brought ruin to Jericho and the surrounding area because it was literally bringing some kind of a poisonous content to the crops and to the fruits and the vegetables, etc. And so they come to Elisha and they say, Elisha, uh, man, this is a beautiful place, but we got a problem here. Listen, the problem was offsetting the beauty of the city. That's what's happening in America, folks. The problem of this land is bringing destruction to our country. You go to Washington, D.C., it's hard to believe. It looks like a third world country. They've got wire. They put wire now around the people's house. They've got wire around the White House. It looks like something you'd see in Haiti. It looks like something you'd see in Cuba. It looks like something you would see in Afghanistan. It looks like something you would see in some other third world country. Why are they doing that? Well, they're afraid somebody's going to go in the Capitol building. They're afraid somebody's going to hurt people. Well, why do they do that? Because their hearts are evil. Amen. And all of the beauties of the city and down in Raleigh, we've got, uh, we've got a beautiful state house. But when you go in now, you've got to go through these uh, machines. You've got to make sure you're not carrying a weapon that will uh, impede on somebody's lifestyle. Why are we having to do all of that in this country? With a beautiful country, no other nation in the world like America. What's the problem? America and the world has got an underlying problem that offsets the beauties of the world. And it's a sin. It's a depravity problem. And the 
people of the world are depraved and we constantly have to act like third world countries to protect our people. Yes, sir. That was Jericho. That was Jericho. Now, I want us to look in the Bible for the next few minutes. Let's see if we can figure out what the problem of Jericho really was. And to do that, I want to ask you to turn back in your Bible. I want you to see it. I'm not only going to tell you, I'm going to tell you where to go. I want you to see it. Turn back in your Bibles, please, to the book of Joshua. Joshua fought the... Now, uh, turn to the book of Joshua. Battle of Jericho. Now, well, I'll stop singing. Now, notice with me in Joshua tonight, chapter 6. And I want you to notice verse 26. They have shouted down the walls of Jericho. Joshua's campaign has taken them over the Jordan. One of the first cities there is, is this city of Jericho. It was the watchtower for the rest of the land. And now the walls have been shouted down. And look with me please in Joshua chapter 6 verse 26. And Joshua adjured them at that time saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city of Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. Kind of a prophetic utterance here. But I want you to notice what Joshua said. Now Joshua is speaking the word of the Lord about Jericho. And what's he saying? He said the city of Jericho now has a curse on it. It has a curse on it. Now what's happening over here in 2 Kings? They are experiencing the curse that's been going on for a good period of time that was placed on this city. But with that in mind, I want you to turn back to the book of 1 Kings. We're in 2 Kings. I want you to turn back to the 16th chapter of the book of 1 Kings. And this is very interesting. In 1 Kings chapter number 16 and verse number 34, I want you to, I want you to watch this with me. In his days... Did Hael the Beth Elite build Jericho? Let's stop a minute right there. This is in the days of Ahab. This is in the day of, days of Jezebel. And here's a builder. He comes along and he says, you know what? I think we ought to just kind of reconstruct the city of Jericho again. So here's a man. Uh, the Bible said that he laid the foundation thereof in Abraham. His firstborn, he set up the gates thereof, and his youngest son, uh, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, that's very important. You don't really pick this up unless you start looking at it in depth. But here's a man that decides he's going to rebuild the city that's got a curse on it. And he starts rebuilding it. And what this verse is actually saying here, he laid the foundation thereof in Abraham. When it says he laid the foundation thereof in Abraham, what he's saying is that he laid the foundation of Jericho in the memorial of his son. And that he, he built the gates of Jericho as a memorial of his son. That's what the wording is saying here. What's he saying? Here's a man that came into the city of Jericho. He decided to rebuild it. Although in the book of Joshua, Joshua said there's a curse on this city. Here's a man that found out that the curse was real because when he tried to rebuild the city, he had two sons who died in the construction and he laid the gates of the city and, they, and uh, he laid the walls of the city. He did it as a memorial to his sons. 
God's word was still true. God said, don't build the city. And here's a man that had to pay a terrible price for trying to rebuild uh, the city of Jericho. Now, the outward attractiveness of the city, as I said earlier, could not offset the fact that there was an indwelling problem there that would necessitate, as they try to go forward with the construction of the city, they got a major problem. Now, I want you to notice, as you look at this, something else, and my time is so fast to getting away. I want you to notice with this problem who the men of the city went to. It's very interesting. They come to Elisha and they say, Elisha, you are, you are in agreement with this, that this is a beautiful city, but we got a problem here. This, this water is, is producing poison in our land. Nothing is growing. Now notice, they went to Elisha. I want you to notice that they did not go to the sons of the prophets. Now the sons of the prophets are there. They're the, they're the ministerial students. You know, what they, you know what they're doing? They're going to Bible college. And the ministerial students, they've been in training. They stood far off as Elijah was taken up to heaven. You read, the, read this chapter and the previous chapter, you see them also following Elisha and Elijah just before he's taken up. When he's finally translated, it says that the sons of the prophets, they're staying at a distance and they're watching Elijah as he goes up. If you remember, they came to Elisha and they said, Elisha, we need to go over to the other side of the mountain and see if Elijah went up and fell down. You remember that? We studied that last time. They did, these sons of the prophets, oh, ye of little faith. What they're saying is, yeah, Elijah got caught up in the chariot, but he might have run out of gas and crashed on the other side of the mountain. And they said, Elisha, let us go over there and see if we can find him somewhere. And Elisha said, you won't find him. God's done taking him. He's transported him to heaven. And they, they said, no, we got to go. So Elisha said, go ahead. Three days later, they came back and they said, we can't find him. Elisha said, well, I told you so. I told you God had transferred him, translated him, raptured him all the way to glory. You know what's going on here? When they got a problem in the city, they're not going to the sons of the prophets. Uh, they're not going over to those little Bible school students uh, because they're men of little faith. Uh, they recognize, they've watched Elisha pick up the mantle of Elijah and stroke the waters of the Jordan and the Jordan stood up on the end and he's walked across and they said, my soul, if somebody's got the power of God on his life like Elisha, we believe that God can use him to change and transform the water in this city so we can have good water, so we can have productivity in our fields and in in our garden. Uh, we don't want to go to the substitutes. We don't want to go to those who lack faith. We want to go to the man of God that's got enough faith that we can ask him to do a miracle and God will do a miracle through him. My friend, some of these liberal churches today, the guys don't have enough power of God on their life to blow the fuzz off of a gander snout. They're as dangerous as an ape with a lit torch walking around in a room full of dynamite. Because they don't have anything to offer but error. They have a lot of error, but they have very little truth. Those sons of the... Years ago, we had a preacher boy in our church. I helped him get off to college. I'll never forget, he got, he got off college. Six months in college, he came back in and he said, Pastor, can I meet with you after service today? I said, sure. As in the other building, we went in my office and sat down. He said, you know, I, I've, really, I've really learned a lot these six months in college. I said, great. I was hoping you would. He said, I've learned up there that you're doing a few things wrong. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. He pulls out a list. Pulls out a list. Now he's six months in school. He knows more than a pastor that's been preaching the gospel for 550 years. He knows more. He knows more. Uh, that boy, don't, he, he don't know how, uh, how thankful he ought to be that he got out of my office breathing. Because it didn't take me but two minutes to straighten him out. Now, the, the truth is, 
the people in the city, they got a beautiful city, but they got a major problem. They need to get to somebody that can get in touch with God. That's what America needs, people who can get in touch with God. And so notice what they did. I love this. And I'm having to pass over a lot of stuff to get down here. But I want you to notice, if you will, in, uh, in uh, and let me get back over in 2 Kings. I'm still here in 1 Kings. Uh, notice, if you will, please, what is happening here. And uh, they come to Elisha and said, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord said, but the water is naught and the ground is barren. And we need some help. So I want you to notice what Elisha did. He did something that we need to learn tonight. I hear people say quite frequently, well, I'm praying that my husband will get saved. I'm praying that my wife will get saved. I'm praying that my children will get saved. I'm praying that my family will get saved. I want you to hear me. They never put any legs on their prayer. I've had people down through the years say, pray for my lost husband. I said, I will. But are, have you witnessed to him? Or pray for my lost wife. I want to get, but have you witnessed to him? Do you know in the Bible, more times than not, when there's a job to be done, if the Lord was doing it, do you understand that on numerous occasions, he sought the assistance of other people because he was willing to help, but he was willing to help with the assistance of other people. And this, that's, what's, that's what's happened here. Notice if you, please, verse number 20. He said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. Now I'm sure Elisha, a man of miracles, could have probably gone over there and prayed. And without that, I, I'm sure he could have probably done that. But he said, I want you to get involved in this. You go bring me a, a, a bottle and you put some salt in it. I need the assistance of a bottle. I need the assistance of salt. And I need your assistance to help me get this miracle complete. When we pray and we ask God, I love that story I heard years ago. A man been praying for years that the liquor house down around the corner would burn down. And he prayed and prayed and it never happened and it prayed and it prayed. And one night the fire trucks are coming through the community and the smoke's coming up down where that liquor store was. And he walked out and said to somebody, said, what's going on? Said, that liquor store down there uh, is on fire and it's burning up tonight. And they said, well, looks like uh, uh, it's an angel. I know you've been praying that it would happen. He said, yeah, I put legs on my prayers. I'm not suggesting you go burn anything up but I'm just telling you when God gets ready to do something he will do it hey you remember when the Lord fed the 5,000 he got somebody else's loaves and fishes you know what he did he multiplied it do you know what he did he didn't give it to the crowd he gave it to his disciples and they distributed it out when Jesus was ready to raise Lazarus from the dead what did he do he stepped up in front of the tomb and he said you take away the stone and I'll get him out when the Lord wanted to preach uh, to the multitudes at the seaside what did he do he borrowed Peter's boat and he went out in the boat and he preached my friend we are laborers together, not only among ourselves, but we're laborers together with the Lord. It's amazing what will happen if we bring the Lord on board. It's amazing what we can accomplish. It's amazing how God will honor us if we'll say, Lord, fill me with your power. Fill me with your presence. Lord, help me go in, not in my strength, help me to go in your strength. God can use us when we go in his strength and in his power. Now, I want you to watch something closely. When we do it, we got to make sure God gets the glory. Amen. Watch it closely. Verse number 20. And he said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters. He cast the salt in there and said, notice who gets the glory. Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters these shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. Who did the healing? Who did the healing? The Lord. 
He made sure the Lord got the praise. What did the Lord do? He used, he used human instrumentality to get the waters pure so that they could have tomatoes behind their sidewalk. <laughs> tomatoes, you like, that's country, isn't it? Tomatoes, tomato, tomatoes. Uh, notice it, thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. I like that. God is looking for people that he can show himself strong through. Brother June. Where's Brother June? Brother June. Come back here. My secretary's on vacation this week. And I checked with her on something today. She said, bus director said, Brother June wants 100 flyers to put out. When she said that to me, I almost had a John the Baptist, sky blue, blood red, shouting fit. You know why? Because he's putting out there what God can honor. I mean, he's going into the second week of the bus ministry. Want a hundred flyers. Me and the Lord's going to get something done. I'm his instrument. I'm going to let him use me and my family. Man, that's what it is. Look, if you're going to get hair restorer, order a comb. <laughs> if you're going out in the field and pray for rain, take an umbrella. Yeah. Amen. If you want to see somebody saved, believe it's going to happen. Amen. Believe that God will use you to do it. Miss Garner, bless her heart, sitting back here. I never will forget, she came to me one time, her husband was unchurched and out in Alcohol City. And she said, Pastor, I want you to get a, I want you to get a Bible, get my husband's names put on it, name put on it. I'm going to put it up on top of the closet. My husband's going to get saved. I've done ask God. I did. I got her a Bible. She put it up. I don't know. How long was it after that? Two years? About two years later, I went by the house. I'd been going by the house. I couldn't get him to move and budge. I finally went by praying, went by. You know what he did? He got saved. She knew it was going to happen. She trusted the Lord. She prayed. God honored her prayer. Her husband got saved. He's in heaven tonight because behind him there was a godly wife that said, I'm going to pray. My husband's going to get saved. A woman came to a morning prayer meeting that was having a revival meeting in a particular city. I heard Dr. Lakin tell this story. And a woman came in that was having prayer before they had the morning service and said she had a uh, cane. She was having to walk. And it said you could hear that tap, 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 tap. When she come in the front of the building, had that uh, cane in her hand and uh, was having prayer request. And she raised that cane up in the air. And she said, pray for my sons. I've got two boys that's lost. And pray that I can get a telegram by tomorrow morning that they've got saved. I believe God can do it. Said some of them laughed at her. Some of them said, that's a foolish woman. That's not going to happen. They went on and had the services in the morning, had the services at night. Next morning, they're taking prayer requests again. And the little lady's not there. And some of them said, I don't guess she got her prayers answered. She's probably embarrassed. She's probably ashamed to come. And said about the time they got ready to pray, they heard that. Tap, tap, tap of that little old cane. Said she came through the front of the church. She held that little old cane up in the air and she was shouting the praises of God. And in her other hand, she had a piece of paper. Said, I got a telegram this morning from one of my boys. And my boy said something happened last night. I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to get saved. And said in a little while, there come tap, tap, tap. Uh, again, down to office, telegraph office. And there came another. One. And the second boy wrote her, sent a letter and said, I got saved saved last night and uh, she came in and she was just praising the Lord. She had two telegraph and said the telegraph operator who came uh, to the uh, uh, to the prayer meeting that morning uh, somebody was talking to him uh, and said how'd that happen? Said well that lady showed up early this morning when I got there and uh, said I'm going to have two telegrams uh, two telegrams uh, this morning and uh, said in a little while tap 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 there come and said uh, uh, she, he said is there anything else I can do? Oh I got another one coming. I got a second one coming 
coming. And said she kept on staying there. Didn't look like anything's coming. Said all of a sudden uh, uh, that telegram came. She believed God could do what God promises to do. We need people again who will say, I can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengtheneth me. We need people who step out by faith and say, with me and God, nothing's impossible. All things are possible. We need to be like, oh, Elisha, I'm there. I'm going to, I'm going to put this salt in there. The salt's not what's going to do it. This is just an instrument, an instrument in God's hand. God is the one that's going to touch it. God is the one that's going to do it. But I, he's going to use the jar, and he's going to use the salt, and he's going to use Elisha just as, a, just as a sign that God's getting ready to do something. But it was God that did. he didn't have to have the salt. He didn't have to have the jar. He didn't have to have Elijah. But he could have done it. But he wants human instrumentality to get his work done. It's time to go. I'm not finished. Hold on just a minute. Gas is too high to buy anyway. I want you to see something. This is the last thing. I want you to see it. Well, preacher, if I get saved, what if I might have a relapse? What if I might lose it? I'm glad you asked. I want you to notice something here. In the last part of verse number 21, the Lord said, I have, I have healed these waters. <clears throat> Watch this. There shall not be from thence any more depth or barren land. Wow. When God touches, there's no relapse. Do you see it? But it gets better. Look at the last verse. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake, God touched the waters. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. In closing, let me prove a point. God used the salt and he used the vessel and he used Elisha. Listen to me. It wasn't the salt that brought the miracle. You know why? Because if the salt had done it, it would just have been a period of time till the water would have been poisoned again when the power of the salt ran out. Are you with me? Wiggle, wiggle. You with me? But do you know, and I didn't know this until I read this recently. There is a spring in Jericho this day that they call the spring of Elisha. The water, if it had been the salt, it would eventually have been poisoned again. But as the writer is writing the book of 2 Kings, there's been no relapse. Even unto this day. Even unto this day. Even unto this day. Even unto this, this day. Are you with me? Even until this day, the water's still pure. The water's still clean. The water's still refreshing. Why? Because God touched it. Amen. And when God touches, he says, take up your bed and walk. You won't need it again. No relapse. Whee! When God touches, God gives permanence with what he does. Elisha, we got a problem. We've got a beautiful city, but it sure has got bad, bad water. Yeah, God will take care of it. And he did. What's your problem tonight? Don't you get mad at me, but I'm going to tell you something. It's going to hit you pretty hard. If you get mad at me, I'll forgive you. Around the altar. You know what you need to start doing, all of us? Quit grumbling and complaining and start talking to God about it. You know something? 
You have never grumbled and complained about anything that brought about the desired end. Put knots in your stomach, etc., and headache in your head. And all the time, it'd be amazing. I like what the preacher said years ago. He, he had some problems going on down to church, and he's just walking the floor and twisting his hands, and his stomach was on fire. He said, well, I'm just going to pick the Bible up. And he started reading. The Bible said, the Lord never slumbers or sleeps. He said, Lord, if you're going to stay up all night, I'm going to go to bed. We need to rest. Listen to me. We need to rest our cases in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. If you have a need tonight, Altars open. We always have an invitation. God can. The psalmist asked the question, can God set a, a table in the wilderness? He said, God can. No impossibilities with God, only possibilities. Now, I don't mean the first time we're going to ask it. Heaven's going to open up in abundance and everything's going to be solved. Sometimes uh, God expects us to keep going and keep praying and keep believing just to prove to ourselves that if we'll keep asking, that's what he said, ask, seek, and find. We have to do that. But there's a God in heaven that's answered multitudes of prayers after people who prayed went on to heaven and God still answered the prayers later. Amen. Father, I want to thank you tonight for telling us in, in this uh, great passage of Scripture about yourself. I want to thank you about how great you make yourself known right here through the life of Elisha. Lord, I want to thank you for the, for the miracle of this place. Down through the years, you've showed yourself sufficient. You've showed yourself strong. And Lord, if our needs here tonight help folks to step out and trust you and claim the promises of your word in Jesus' name and for his sake, sing this stanza. If others need to come, would you slip out and come tonight?